Hey guys, welcome back. I've got another story for you today. Today I've got the story of Oshin and Nave. This is a wonderful story. It's the last story in what's called the Fenian cycle of Irish mythology, and it's very touching. Um, now this story sort of, um, it has in it one of the Celtic other worlds. Now Celtic other worlds are really interesting because we've got um, just a few little clues about Celtic other worlds in the, in the folklore and the myth and the smoke going into my face. Um, so uh, Celtic other worlds, I, I think they're, they're sort of, they sort of seem like they're parallel universes in sort of modern parlance. They're sort of, uh, they're sort of in the same space as our world, but we can't really reach them except maybe at certain times of year or certain thin places where the veil between worlds becomes thin. That's sort of the idea with Celtic other worlds. So Halloween, Samhain is one time where the world, the veils are thin. Beltane as well. And sometimes uh, between doorways, you can enter other worlds there. That's why I always forget things when I uh, go from one room to another. Um, also, um, the surface of water, lakes and pools in Celtic folklore can be doorways, also the sea. So on this channel before I've told the story of Dermot and the King Underwave. Uh, so that's another world, there's the Plain of Wonder, there's the realm of the She, um, the fairy realm. But in this story we've got a land called Tirnano. That means uh, in the Gaelic, the land of undying, the land of the ever young, the land of eternal youth. You could compare this maybe in Greek mythology to the Elysian fields, maybe, I don't know if that's a good, a good analogy, or certainly uh, maybe Valhalla or Asgard. Anyway, we get a bit of a sense of Celtic other worlds in this story. So without further ado, here we go. So this was after the last battle that the Fianna, those ancient warrior poets of old Ireland and Britain, it was after their last battle. And the Fianna were making their way back towards the castle of the High King of Ireland on the plain of Tara. And as so often happens in these stories, they're making their slow way back and a white heart, a white deer, suddenly erupts out of the forest. And those, uh, those uh, warrior hunters, the Fianna, they give chase. They chase that white heart all the way through the forest, down through the glades. And then suddenly they lose sight of it, but they find themselves on a beach, a hidden cove facing west with silvery sand, just like this one. I'm actually in Devon, not Ireland, but I am facing west. And the Fianna are there and they've lost sight of that deer, it's gone. But they're in the most beautiful secret cove that none of them has ever laid eyes on before. And they're just wonder falls upon them and they're just marveling at the, the beauty of this whole place. And there, out of the setting sun, there's a light and it grows brighter and brighter and brighter and it resolves itself into a single pinprick of white. It's a horse. It's a white horse riding clean over the surface of the water, Jesus Christ style and it gets closer and closer and then it trots right onto the beach, right towards the Fianna, right towards their leader, Finn McCool. I'm sure you've heard that name before. On top of this horse is sat a rider, a female, and there are great poems written about her beauty. Her eyes are as clear as the dew, <laughs> unlike my eyes right now with the smoke of this fire. Her hair is like gold rings, her face is as pale as the moon. She's wearing the most extraordinary, beautiful, jeweled clothing. Uh, the trimming 
one of her horses all silver and gold and silk and beautiful satin and she rides up right up to Finn McCool and she addresses him from the saddle of her magic white horse and she says Finn McCool long is the journey I have taken to find you and Finn McCool always uh, courteous in his greeting says and who might you be and she says my name is Nave and I come from Tir Nano, the land west across the sea the land of the ever not of the ever young and I come for your son Oshin Oshin son of the deer Oshin of the silver tongue Oshin the poet I come for your son Oshin right there I come to take him back to my realm and I come to make him my husband Oshin he's standing there and he's been looking at this <laughs> fairy woman ride across the sea on a white horse and every particle of his being has fallen desperately desperately in love with her with the movement of her limb with the sound of her voice with uh, with the sparkle in her eyes and Nave she looks at Oshin and says will you have me Oshin and he says yes I will and many tears were in the eyes of the Fianum as they all hugged Oshin goodbye little did they know they would never see him again so Oshin mounted that white horse tangled in the arms of his fairy bride and off they rode off across the sea until they turned into a speck of white and vanished and the Fianna they trundled back to the palace of the High King Katara and they never saw Oshin again Finn McCool never saw his son again now Oshin meanwhile he's on the back of that fairy horse and all sorts of wonder is rampaging through his brain he's riding over the waves and he sort of loses track of time hours days as he ridden he's fallen right out of time he's fallen into into mythic time right and there's riding and the plane of the sea is as flat as glass he's riding i don't know he's halfway across the atlantic ocean by now and suddenly there's a great storm whipping up around them great columns of water are erupting out of the sea great columns of fire are coming down from the sky a great torment of mist and smoke and a sheen clutches Nave's waist tightly and he's very afraid and he's about to speak out but she says hush be still there is nothing to fear and a great wall of water rises and a great wall of mist and smoke rising up and Oshin can almost fancy that through the water, through the wall of water approaching towards him, he can see lights flickering like fire. He can see great palaces, great towers rising up, the likes of which he has never seen before. And then a door opens in the sea, in the waves right before him opens up and that horse marches straight through it and it closes behind and the sea becomes flat again and Oshin and Nave are nowhere to be seen. Oshin now he's in another world there's a great meadow of flowers and trees before him and beyond that there's a, a city sparkling white no city has ever been seen like it before Athens, Rome, Alexandria, ancient Egypt, Varanasi, no city of the ancient world can even hold up a single petal to this city. It was all columns and glass and great towering glittering spires. It was achingly beautiful. And Nave and Oshin on that white horse, they trot through a meadow up to a great temple on a hill with great white columns and pouring out of the huge jeweled doors of that citadel 
are the most beautifully dressed beings, fairy beings that Oshin has ever seen uh, in crowns and flowing gowns and all this finery. And what looks like the king and queen say, Oshin, you've come at last. We have been waiting for you for a long time. You will marry our daughter, Nave. And marry her, he did. And he stayed in that place for a long, long time. A place where there is no death, no sickness, where any desire is fulfilled. Just as soon as you think it, it's fulfilled. Where there is no sadness, no longing, no suffering. And Nave in that place bore Oshin three children. A son, they called him Finn, <laughs> and two little girls. But you know, after a while, after three years, Oshin longed for the rolling hills of Ireland. He longed for the hunt. He longed for mead and the drinking halls. He longed for the music. He longed for the, the stories of Erin and Albion. He longed for all these things. He longed for home. He loved his wife dearly. He loved the land of the Everly Young. Of course, he loved his dear children, but he just wanted to see Ireland one last time. And he told his wife that, and she said, Oshin, my love, bright star of my whole understanding, if you go, you will never return. <laughs> what? said Oshin. Of course I will. I'll come right back. Look, I've got the magic horse, haven't I? I'll take your horse. I'll take the white horse. I'll ride across the sea. I'll be right back. And she said, why do you want to go back? Your friends, they're all dead, you know. In the three years you've been here, 300 years have passed. And this was a shock to Ashin. He didn't know that. She didn't tell him that. Well, if that is true, at least I want to see I want to see the land of Ireland again. See its people. The people are different. They're all little midgets now. They're, <laughs> they're led by little clerics reading from their books in Latin. It's not the same place. You can never return if you go. I can never return or I will never return, said Asheen. I know you will never return if you go. And Asheen had said, Surely it's my own choice. He made up his mind by now anyway. He just, he, he longed so much to go back to Ireland. So he did. He took that white horse and he said, I will be back to his wife. And if, if time passes differently there, then surely it will just be a, 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 a few days before I wind myself back in your arms, my darling, bright star of my whole understanding. And with that, he mounted that white horse and he was gone back east across the sea over and he dropped into time this time he he rode through the door in the waves until he came trotting over the sea right back onto the shores of ireland well knave was right ireland was a different place now Hundreds and hundreds of years had passed. Now, you need to know, before Oshin set off, Nave gave him a piece of advice. She said, I believe you will never return in spite of all his promises. But she said, at least promise me this, do not let one foot touch the soil of your native land. If it does, you cannot return. And Asheen said, understood. So he stayed firm in the saddle of that white horse as he trotted up the beach. And there were so many houses that were never there before. 
Island was a wild, empty place before, but now there were houses everywhere, all dotted along the shore. And they were little, squat, sordid little dwellings. And out of them came people to gawp at him. Nave was right. They were, they were little, half the size of a sheen. The people had shrunk. They'd become little, little dwarves. And they gawped and pointed at the clothes a sheen was wearing. And they were dressed in what seemed to a sheen like rags, sacks, dull, dreary clothes. And their faces were grey and ashen. And there was no life in their eyes. And they marvelled at a sheen as if he was some kind of god. Because in a way, he was. He'd fallen from one time to another, you see. Now, Asheen, he rode. He rode all across Ireland. He rode to the points where all the high kings of islands used to have their courts. But the castles and the fair palaces and the camping grounds of where he used to hang out with the Fianna and hold court with the various kings of Ireland, Nothing was there, just burial mounds, standing stones, ruins covered in moss, in desolate forgotten places. And the people that he met told stories about them, that they were inhabited by ghosts or fairies. But he recognised the shape of the land, but nothing else was the same. He could barely even understand the language of the people that he met. So, much disappointed, much, much disappointed in his native land of Ireland, of Erin, that was nothing the same, Oisin made his decision to ride back across the sea, back to Tir Nano, the land of the ever young, to see his wife and children again. That little itch had been scratched. Ireland was not the same place. It was perhaps best left in his memory. I'm sure we all know the feeling. So off he went, back towards the sea, and he just came to the shore and a large stone had fallen across a path and there were some uh, farmers, some simple folk trying to move it. And so small they were that they couldn't do it at all. So Asheen, he, without thinking, leapt out of his saddle and strong and large as he was, he easily lifted that stone up. And those, uh, those uh, common folk thanked him, but then something in their face changed. And Asheen wondered what it was, and then he looked down at his own hands, and they were shriveling up. They were wrinkling. He looked at his own form, and he was shriveling up into the state of an old, wizened man. And that horse, it had bolted across the sea and left him stranded, wizened, old, and alone, a relic from another time. And that's exactly how Saint Patrick found him and Oisin spilled all the stories of the Fianna, all the mythology of the Celtic world, every story we still have today Oisin told to St Patrick, that little Christian saint, and he wrote it all down and that's how we still have it today. So thank you St Patrick and thank you Oisin and thank you all of you for listening if you've made it this far. And that's why I believe it's important to carry on these treasures of oral culture for the next generation, just like Oisin did, and just like St. Patrick did, and just like all of us should do as well. And if you've enjoyed this story by this smoky-eyed storyteller, and if you want me to continue what I'm doing, please like and subscribe. And if you want, you can become a Patreon of uh, me, and I'll help me continue what I'm doing. Uh, <clears throat> I'll put a link in the description. Thank you, by the way, to Drowsy Zot, who has become my first uh, Raven subscriber. I'm going to send you a, a wooden trinket or some kind of wooden spoon carved by uh, my or my partner here's fair hands from a tree from uh, Britain or Ireland. Uh, and I will send that to you. Thank you very much for listening. I'll see you again next time. See you later.